if you don't have a copy of that worksheet, okay, then you need to go to the website here and call it up. Science 10 stuff. Okay, and it'll be in physics. And I believe it will be in Lesson 15, Work Energy 2. Yep. Okay, so Lesson 15, Work Energy 2. Okay, go there and that's where you can find the electronic copy of that. Okay, the issue with it is that the answers are not on it. Okay, but you can always check with someone who has theirs if you want to check your answers as you go. Okay, so I'm going to give you a few minutes to work on that, and then I will go over any ones that are giving you trouble. Okay, guys, we just had a question here about uh, number seven, about the shot putter. So they, they put a shot whose weight is 71.1 newtons. Okay, um, so here's what we mean when we say weight. Okay, this is on your formula sheet, but just kind of a quick reminder. Okay, on your formula sheet, you see this formula that the force of gravity is mass times the acceleration due to gravity, 9.81. Okay? The force of gravity is your weight. So if a question gives you your weight or something's weight in newtons, they've already done that for you. Okay? So if it was a potential energy problem like that question is, okay, you know that the 71.1 newtons times h will give you EP because this is M times G times H. Okay, follow me there? All right, so if a question gives you weight, they've given you the force of gravity, and you can calculate what you need to from there. All right, so they've essentially saved you a step. Okay, okay so a person riding a sled down a hill is a classic law of conservation of energy example. Okay, it's just like a roller coaster. Anytime gravity is the only force that's acting, you're looking at a law of conservation of energy problem because there's no other forces doing work. And as a result, there's no way to lose or gain any energy. Everyone follow me there? Okay, so falling, being on a roller coaster, sledding down a hill, any of those kind of things are law of conservation of mechanical energy type situations. All right, so here's what we know. Um, the person's riding the sled down the hill. They never tell us the mass, but we know already that that's because you don't need it. It'll cancel out, okay? If you don't like that it doesn't give it to you, pick a number, right? We went over that already, okay? <coughs> so we know that since there's only gravity acting, okay, that EI equals EF, okay? So that's kind of our first situation, okay? The next thing we got to do is decide if we have all four of these kinds of energy. All right, um, so I read the context of the question. They're on the top of a hill that's 4.6 meters tall. Okay, so they have this stuff then, because they're above the ground when they start. They start at the top with a speed of 3.1 meters per second. So do they have this? Yeah, they have initial kinetic energy as well. Okay, what will their speed be? Okay, well, if they're asking me what their speed will be at the bottom, that means they have some, so they definitely have final kinetic energy. But they're talking about the bottom of the hill. Do I have any potential energy at the bottom? No. So this term can be canceled because it's zero. Okay, so now I can plug in my formulas. I'm looking for VF, which is part of this term. Okay, since I don't have this term here, I don't have to move anything yet. So I've got m times g times hi plus one half mvi squared equals one half mvf squared. Everyone following me so far? Okay. I want to get vf by itself. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of all the m's since they didn't give me mass anyway. Okay, I don't really need it. All right, now what do I do? Divide by one half. Yeah, I only have to move one thing. All right, then what do I have to do? I got a square root. 
All right, so now I can plug in my numbers and solve. So I've got 9.81 times 4.6 plus 1 half times 3.1 squared. So 4.6 was the height of the hill. 3.1 was the speed of the sled at the top of the hill, because, I mean, most of us, you know, take a running start, okay, if we're going to go sledding down a hill, right, you, you grab the little crazy carpet thing, and you run, and then you dive onto it, right, okay, so we've got that situation going on there, and then I divide that by one half, so here's G, here's HI, here's VI, right, when I plug all of that in, I should get 10 meters per second, okay, if you were getting 9.5, it's because you forgot that the sled had kinetic energy at the top, and that's why you're getting a lesser number than what I got. Okay, it's because you, you misinterpreted the question and didn't see that there was kinetic energy at the top. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, any other ones? 15? Okay, so 15 is, uh, you have to do a little bit of calculating, but after that it's it's quite straightforward. It's basically fill this table in. Okay, so I have a two kilogram rock that's released from a height of 20 meters. So it's released. That means dropped. So what kind of energy does it have at the beginning of this question? Potential only. All right, so if I calculate its potential energy at the top, what have I also calculated that is true everywhere during the fall? The mechanical energy. Okay, remember, mechanical energy is the sum of the kinetic and the potential. If you don't have any kinetic, then your potential equals your mechanical. So this allows me, this first part of the question, allows me to calculate the mechanical energy by simply going m times g times h with this initial number. Okay, everyone follow me there? It only has potential energy when it's being released, so when I calculate that, that's this number. This number, this number, this number, and this number. All the way down, right? Because we know mechanical energy never changes. Everyone okay with that part? Okay. All right, so when I go uh, 2 times 9.81, I get 19.62, okay, and then multiply that by 20, so. All right, so I get 390, no, 392.4 joules. All right, so that's how much I've got here, 392.4 joules, 392.4 joules. There and there and there. Okay, I know that number doesn't change. It's the same all the way down. All right. So, how much kinetic energy do I have at the height of 20 meters? Zero. Okay. Remember, mechanical energy is EK plus EP. If I know this equals 392, 392 plus 0 equals 392. This has to be 0. All right. Now, the only things I have to calculate all the way down are the potential energies. I can figure out the kinetic energies by doing what? By subtracting the potentials from the mechanical, and I fill in the chart from there. Okay, does that sort of make sense? So all that one was really checking was, do you remember mechanical energy is EK plus EP? There's a long-winded way of doing that, but that's what it was checking. Okay. Okay, any other ones? 14. All right, pole vaulter approaches the takeoff point at a speed of 9 meters per second. All right, since that's where the question starts, I'm going to assume that that is VI. Okay. Assuming that only her speed influences how high she can rise, find the maximum height she can reach. All right. So in pole vault, we're going to simplify it here and assume she vaults straight up in the air. You wouldn't do that in real pole vault because that would result in you falling on your head. Okay. But we're going to just simplify it a little bit and say that that's what happened. All right. So when she's on the ground, that's her takeoff point, the ground, does she have any potential energy? She can't, right? Because her height is zero when she's on the ground, right? So we know that HI is zero meters per second. It doesn't outright say that, but if it says ground as a reference point, you know that at least one of the potential energies in the question is zero. In this case, we're starting on the ground. Okay. Um, 
At her maximum height, the thing we don't know, how fast is she going? Remember that we simplified this and said she went straight up in the air. Zero, right. Okay, remember that at your maximum height, if you're moving straight up in the air, okay, your velocity or speed is zero. Because that's the point where you stop, turn around, and start coming back down. Okay, so we got EI equals EF. Okay, so EPI plus EKI equals EPF plus EKF. Okay, and we've established that this is zero because we're talking about the maximum height where they're not moving. And we've established that this is zero because their initial point is on the ground where you can't have any potential energy. All right, everyone with me so far? Yeah? Okay. Formula for kinetic energy is 1 half mvi squared. Formula for potential energy is m times g times hf. And I'm looking for hf. How do I get it by itself? Divide by mg. Okay, I'm going to cancel the m's because they never told me what the pole voltage mass was anyway. Okay. 1 half times vi squared divided by g. So 1 half times 9 squared over 9.81 okay, should give us 4.12 meters, which is a mighty impressive pole vault. Nobody at the meet yesterday did anything near that. Could have high jumped half the pole vault bars. Okay. Any other ones? Okay, how many people are done the whole front side of the sheet? Anyone done both sides? Okay. All right. Keep working on that for a little while longer here, and then we're going to start talking about uh, some of the other stuff we're going to be heading into here. Okay, so guys, there's been a question come up here on uh, number four in the potential energy part uh, just a couple of times here. So with the pendulum, Okay, if they tell you that the pendulum is two and a half meters long, okay, that means like that. But if I lift it 45 degrees, have I lifted it halfway to the top? Okay, so now it's how far from the lowest point? Okay, which would be how far? 1.25 meters, right? If I lift it all the way up to here, It'll be two and a half meters higher than its lowest point. But if I lift it 45 degrees, okay, then it's going to be 1.25 meters higher than its lowest point. The reason I picked 45 is because I didn't want you to have to do any trigonometry. Right? I just figured 45 you'd know was halfway, but okay, it's okay. Now I'm telling you, it's halfway. Okay, so it makes a little more sense. Okay. Any other ones giving us trouble there? 17. Okay, so woman runs with a speed of 5.4 meters per second off a platform that's 10 meters above the water. All right, so I'm going to say that VI equals 5.4 meters per second, and her initial height is 10 meters. Okay, How fast is she moving when she hits the water? Well, I'm assuming the height of the platform is measured from the water. So what's, the, what's her height when she hits the water? Zero. Okay, And so we're looking for the speed she hits the water at. Okay, so the only force acting is gravity, which means there's no forces doing any work. Okay, nothing slowing it down, her down, nothing speeding her up, okay, other than gravity. All right, so we've got then the initial energy. Well, she's moving and she's above the ground. Does she have both kinds? Okay, so we got initial potential and we've got initial kinetic. Do we have any final potential? No, because she's hitting the lowest point. Her height will be zero. Okay, but we're trying to find how fast she's going, which would imply she does have some of that. All right, now I can plug in my formulas. M times G times H initial plus one half MVI squared equals one half MVF squared. Okay, I'm trying to find VF, so what do I do with all the M's first? 
Right, get rid of them. Okay, now what do I do with the half? Divide it over. Okay, and then square root. Okay, so I should have that VF equals the square root of 9.81 times 10 plus 1 half times 5.4 squared divided by 1 half. What I find most often happens for people is they forget to square this one of the speeds when they're doing a problem like this. They just punch in you know, 5.4 and they forget to square it and then that obviously leads to uh, an incorrect answer. Okay, um, so just always double check that you're remembering to square. Okay, and uh, and most of the time that seems to be the issue. The other issue I find is that people don't do it one piece at a time, and then their calculator screws it up by doing order of operations, which in this case we don't want it to do. Okay, so just watch for those kind of two things. Okay, any other ones? Okay, I'm going to give you a little break from the worksheet for a little while here. We're going to talk about what we're going to be doing uh, tomorrow and probably a little bit on Friday. Um, I don't think our class ends up being shortened tomorrow, but all the others do. Okay, so tomorrow we're going to be doing a lab that was like the work lab. Okay, except this time we're going to shoot these little cars out. I'll show you what they look like. So typically, okay, we use these little Hall's carriages. They're not great. The wheels aren't real good, okay? But the point of it is not to see how far the car will go. It's to see how much of the energy from the rubber band is going to be actually transferred to the cart. So we'll have that same situation, okay, where we've got, uh, you know, the, the two uh, legs of the desk and the rubber band, you know, is, is stretched between them, okay? So we get, right, the, uh, the kind of Y... <laughs> I don't even know what that's looking like now. Um, okay, we get the Y shape in there, and then we got the car... Uh, kind of, man, I can't draw. This is really a struggle for me here. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, the cars in the rubber bands drawn back from the two table legs. Yeah, I think you get the idea. Okay, so we're going to draw it back. Obviously, we know how to calculate the work done because we did that lab already. Right? That's going to be the elastic potential energy in the rubber band. What we're trying to find out is how much of that potential energy and work will actually get transferred to the cart. Okay? The way we'll calculate that is we'll figure out how much work friction has to do to stop the cart. Okay? The cart's not going to go very far. I mean, even in a perfect situation, they don't go very far. Right? There's a, there's a fair amount of friction between their wheels and the floor, okay? And their wheels and the bearings and whatever else, right? Then you can hear them that they squeak even, all right? But the point is not so much to see how, how far they go as to just figure out how much of the energy that they were given initially ends up actually being in the cart and how much of it gets lost in the process or in the transfer. So things we need to think about are when we set this up and we pull this cart back and then let it go, where are some other places the energy might go other than to the cart? Okay, Because um, obviously, when we do our calculations uh, after the lab, we're going to find that the cart doesn't have as much energy as the work we did in pulling back the rubber band. Right? So what our job will be is to figure out what happened to the rest of it. We know the law of co conservation of mechanical energy is true. Okay, Initial energy equals final energy. Work energy theorem says if I pull back and, and do 200 joules worth of work, the cart's got to get 200 joules worth of energy. Well, But that's in the perfect utopian physical world. In the real world, that doesn't happen. Okay, Because there's all kinds of things that are evidence that energy is going elsewhere. Right? Okay. Um, probably even, you know, like the rubber band, you know, you can probably hear that when it gets released, okay, things like that. So those are going to be all kind of things we want to think about as to where that energy is going. Now, we talked about how work is force times distance, okay? And we're going to do that calculation in a couple of different ways in this lab. We're going to do it the easy way, like this, the force we pull back on the rubber band with and the distance we pull it back, okay? That'll be our kind of input energy. Okay? But then we got to figure out, okay? So that'll be our potential energy that's going to drive the system. In the perfect physical world, all of that work would become kinetic energy for the cart. It's not going to happen in this lab, but what we want to figure out is how much kinetic energy did the cart have right at the beginning? But what do we need to know in order to get that? 
we need to know how fast it's going and there's no way for us to measure that when it first comes off of the rubber band I don't have a Doppler gun here like a radar gun like the police have okay we can't just figure out how fast the cart's going okay it doesn't work that way so what we have to do is figure out using how far the car travels how much energy it had based on that okay so we're gonna use this but if you recall on your formula sheet we have a formula for force okay what is it uh, that's for force of gravity just for force in general it's mass times acceleration All right so we're gonna be using this formula mass times acceleration times distance yeah I know it says mad okay now um, this will allow us to figure out okay the amount of work that's done by friction in slowing the cart down so if the cart comes to a stop is the work done by friction in stopping it equal to the amount of energy it had when it left the rubber band yes it is because that's where all the energy goes okay friction uses it up all right so when we figure out how much work is done against friction that'll equal the kinetic energy of the rubber band and then we won't have to know how fast it was going at the beginning we're gonna circumvent using one half mv squared because we don't have all the numbers we need okay everyone kinda with me on that one so there's a bit more measuring we do have to be kinda careful on how we do it um, you probably will have to do multiple trials because the cart needs to go reasonably straight okay? it needs to go reasonably straight now we're gonna try and be smart about how we measure it if it does okay so when you shoot it out of here yeah we want it to go like this but realistically it's probably gonna do a little bit of this and maybe a little bit of that how do you measure like a curve like that with a meter stick well except that if I measure the straightest point I'm not measuring how far the car went I'm measuring the displacement which is different than the distance right so if I measure a straight line like this that's not how far the car actually went a little bit further than that exactly we we'll use a string okay lay a string down on the ground that kind of follows the path of the cart we're not going to know exactly the path of the cart but we'll be able to kind of approximate it a little bit okay which will be more accurate than a straight line which cuts off quite a bit of its distance so we make a string follow the path of the cart okay, and then pick the two ends of the string straighten it measure it with a ruler Right. Then we've got the actual distance traveled by the cart, and that's going to be quite a bit more accurate okay, than trying to measure, measure it straight. Okay, Everybody with me there? All right. um, so it will involve us using the board markers a little bit and writing on the floor a little bit. Okay, Just make sure you take that off when you're done. The janitors don't like it when they're done that lab and there's numbers and lines all over the ground. Okay, So we'll have to make sure that we erase them all. But that's what we're going to be looking at. So it's going to be a bit of, of this, a little bit of EI equals EF. Okay, it's also going to be a little bit of this. Okay, so this lab is going to bring in conservation of energy. It's going to bring in work energy theorem. Right, and uh, it's going to introduce to us the idea of efficiency, which is what we will talk about on Monday. Okay, and efficiency is a percentage, essentially, of how much of the work you did actually did what you wanted it to do. Okay, and how much of it was wasted essentially to, to other forces and other things. All right? So that's it's kind of a it, it's a simple lab in terms of how you do it, but there's quite a bit of stuff to kind of analyze and go through. All right? So that's why we're gonna have today or sorry, not today, tomorrow and a bit of Friday's class, okay, to kind of work on that a bit. So we got time to talk with our group mates and, and do good analysis of what happened. All right, everybody with me there? Okay, so it's kind of going to be like a two-day lab almost, okay, working on this one. Okay, um, I will also give out to you tomorrow uh, your unit exam review um, package, okay? I won't do the actual formal exam review until Tuesday, right? Um, but you will get the formal exam review sheet, okay, on... Uh, on Thursday so that you can look at it over the weekend and start start having a look at it so you can come in and schedule help and stuff and ask uh, ask questions then okay and of course in our formal review class if you got questions that's also a good time to ask okay all right questions on that the lab uh, I am probably gonna make it due after the exam which means it's not gonna be as helpful for you to study with but I don't want you to have an elaborate report 
when you're supposed to be studying for your unit exam. So there's kind of no way around that one. Um, however, if you do your lab report like over the weekend or something and you want me to look it over so that you know if you did it right and then you can use it to study from, I'm fine with that. Okay, so if you got it done and you want me to look it over, no problem there. Okay, and then you can use it uh, to study from. Okay, all right. There's about 10 minutes left. I want you to finish that worksheet. Tomorrow's quiz will be posted a little bit later on today, and it's going to be on conservation of energy. Okay. okay so on uh, on number 13 here, we've got this uh, 5,000 kilogram car. And it's moving through a 50 meter long snowdrift that's been blown onto the road. When it goes in, it's going at a speed of 20 meters per second. And when it exits, it's only going 8 meters per second. So what's happened to it? OK, it's slowed down. Was there a decrease in energy? OK, so if there's a decrease in energy, there's a change in energy. Did the snowdrift do work on the car? Or actually, it's the other way. The car did work on the snowdrift because the car lost energy, right? So what we're looking at here is a work is a change in energy, in this case, kinetic energy for the car, okay? It's losing some of its energy to the deformation of the snowdrift, right? So work is force times distance, and we're looking for force, okay? And that's going to equal the change in energy, so that's going to be 1 half mvf squared minus 1 half mvi squared. Okay, and we've got all of that, so we're going to divide both sides by the distance, because we were told how big the snowdrift was. It was 50 meters. Does that make sense, Jacob? Okay, so um, we'll have one half times 5,000 times uh, VF was eight, eight squared minus one half times 5,000 times 20 squared divided by 50. Okay, and when we do that, this number actually comes out negative, and it should, because the force was exerted backwards on the car. That's why it slowed down. Okay, so we get 16,800 newtons, and it's negative. Okay, any other ones there, guys?